When I awoke in the morning, I laid in the hammock for a moment, just looking across at Keith. He was dead asleep, but I could see the bruising on his forehead, where he'd struck the tree yesterday. His torso was a, just a mass of bandages. His wounds looked like he'd been hit by a car, not an animal. Can I do this without him? I immediately felt horrible for the thought. Some of it was the situation we were all each other had to depend on, and here he was, laid out, injured. Then there was the literal interpretation of the thought. I was a strong, tough woman, but the wilderness didn't care about that. Given what I'd been shown thus far, could I actually survive if he was pulled from the competition? Most likely not. I need to get better, and sooner rather than later. I got out of the hammock and retrieved my clothing from the dresser, a smaller shell container that Keith had set up for me to keep rodents and insects out of it. Whether I cared to admit it or not, I felt for him. If it weren't for the sake of humanity, I wouldn't even question his actions yesterday. Sure, he'd risked his life, but whether soldier, medic, or EMT, they were all jobs based on protecting the lives of others in one way or another. Then there was his statement yesterday, as he stalked over to finish the dire cougar, as he put it, this universe doesn't get to take one more thing from me. It didn't take a doctorate in psychology to realize why Keith put himself in the line of fire so easily. Once dressed, I checked the bandages, and Keith didn't even stir any more than to murmur about me smelling nice, which got a smile out of me, but otherwise he was still out. He might as well be. It wasn't as if there was a ton for him to do. I flushed as I realized I was stroking his hair, then walked outside. Outside I saw one of the reasons those feelings were starting to exist, Ragnar and Greltha, asleep in their tent. The Rothani he had brought home with him. By nature, he wouldn't let people suffer, wouldn't give up on them, wouldn't abandon them. All he had to do to win was nothing. Just keep living his life here, and wait for everyone else to drop from the competition one way or another. And he couldn't do it. The camp looked quite different than before I had gone to bed. For one, a giant loom was erected down the bluff a bit on the leeward side. When I got closer, I understood the reason for that. It absolutely reeked, and placing it there made sure the scent went away from the camp. The fur from the cat's hide was gone, and next to it, some sort of solution I didn't want to know the contents of. There were other things to look at anyway, such as what was now a rather large smoking shack, and I could see smoke coming out slowly near the top. The meat from the cat was in there. I'm not even certain if cougar meat on earth is properly edible, but according to my guide, it should be. Taste, however, was another point. That aside, Keith literally couldn't have done this work, and I certainly didn't, leaving just the Rothani to thank. Quite literally, hundreds of pounds of meat were being preserved, meaning no one would need to hunt for some time. I checked on the meat, opening the door of the smoke shack, but the meat didn't seem ready yet. The Rothani had done a lot for us in the night, and it gave me hope that they were trying so hard to be of use. It had been a gamble. They could just as easily have run off with our gear, food, or whatever they wanted, or even eliminated us from the competition in our sleep. Instead, they'd help get the camp further along. Certainly, they had helped themselves to some food, but honestly, we were rather full up on meat, so I wasn't precisely offended at the thought. Then... Where our containers appeared, there was a pile of bags and small containers. A few I recognized. The EMT bag had appeared after the fight with the dire cougar, so some sort of achievement Keith had gotten there. The first we had gotten yesterday was, thank God, a rig-up for a camp shower, along with a giant bar of natural soap, goat's milk, oatmeal, and honey for the camp achievement. I'd set that up yesterday just after Keith left to head down by the river, and yes, I rather luxuriated in being able to take a hot shower, even if I had to heat up the water in the black bladder of the thing. The soap I had to cut into more usable blocks, but I'm hardly complaining about that. That left one container for an achievement I didn't know, gotten while Keith was away. Inside had been a long rectangular nylon case, and when I opened it, saw before me a full set of chef's knives along with a whetstone. It probably wasn't the greatest of survival equipment, but I knew how to use these. I had planned on using them to cook up a nice dinner, but things had gotten away from us last night, admittedly. Now, there were all these little boon bats, most of which were things I had to assume were sent as peace offerings by the other species Keith had called out to last night. Two, however, were from Earth, a pair of insulated bags, 
and I laughed hysterically when I saw what was inside them. A warm pizza in a box marked sizzle pie, a six-pack of amber drop top, and some ice cream sandwiches from Ruby Jewel, still currently frozen. Portland had answered our first day musings. The bags themselves were maintained on some sort of battery power, obviously, but I didn't know how long that power supply would even last. I didn't know enough to understand a way to use them longer term. I could have just woken Keith up, sure, but why not? Let's have to fun with it. I went into the tent with the box of pizza and wafted the box over him. At first nothing happened, and then I heard the sniff. Keith came awake surprisingly alert, and I laughed. Seriously? That worked? Keith sat up a bit in the hammock. Oh God, I know that smell. Wait, is one of those mine? Pointing at the ice cream sandwiches. I, I remembered the sandwiches. Ruby Jewel was from home. They made cookie ice cream sandwiches, and they were really good. Oh yeah, I've got lavender lemon. The s'mores one is mine. And there's a classic. And finally, oatmeal butterscotch. Ooh, lavender lemon. Really? I thought you military guys were big macho men? I chuckled, handing him the sandwich. Keith tore open the packaging immediately. Hun, I hunted down a 14-foot alien cougar and personally shoved my own shoulder back into socket before killing it with a knife, before walking my ass back to camp and threatening an alien empire. I could draw a hot bubble bath while reading me some Nora Roberts and blasting Taylor Swift, and I'd still have more man points than any y'all on Earth. He's not wrong. Honestly, though, I was hungry, but first, we had two spare ice cream sandwiches and a couple of guests. I went over to the Rothani, and as gently as I could, I woke up Greltha, offering her the sandwiches I wasn't going to eat. She sniffed, and her ears perked up. Thank you, Lady Val. It's just Val. Okay, Lady Valerie did sound kind of good. In any event, Greltha woke up Ragnar and gave him the classic sandwich, while I went to enjoy my own treat. The pizza was similarly easy to divvy up, two slices apiece. Keith looked so happy with his. For me, it was an excellent chance not to have to prep food for the morning, so that meant I could focus on bigger items. First up, the mushroom log. Keith had gone over the basics, but we needed to get to work on making farmed mushrooms a reality. I called him out to sit, and he did so using a long, thick branch the Rothani had brought, then took me through the basics. All right now, guess we're starting us up this stuff again. Well, if and you look over here, You'll see where it's growing, right? What you want to do is to take off the stem and flower of the mushroom without hurting the roots of the thing called mycelium. You'll do better with a small knife, and if you can grab Pop's hand drill, that'll speed you right along. He was very patient with the process, explaining how his grandma had taught him to do it, and even showed me a trick for using sawdust in a mason jar as a growth medium. We could essentially propagate the mycelium in the jars, then transplant to the log, since a perfect atmosphere could more easily maintained in the jars, but the logs allowed for better long-term growth. As our stock of mushrooms increased, we'd be doing both. Once I'd set up some of the drill holes and gotten our first crop of mushrooms planted, he directed me through how to cut up the yams for planting so we could get that underway. Keith explained all of it, and he covered mistakes by going over his own errors, even once he knew what he was doing. Next, he went with me to check nets, while he sat there, braced so he could turn a branch into a proper fishing pole, whittling away as best he could with one hand, only using the other to steady it. We got a couple more fish, one from the net, and another from him actually casting with the pole, using worm bait. He took me through cleaning and gutting the catch, since he couldn't, and showed me how to tie them up to a line, so I could carry them more easily. Finally, he picked up the bow, and after going over it a minute, handed it to me, and had me set up on a short fat log on one of the rocks to use as a target. At first, he didn't even have me knocking an arrow, instead focusing on drawing the bowstring. Again, he was very patient here, correcting my stance by moving my position until it was all correct. He explained to never dry fire the bow, but to slowly bring the bowstring back to rest, so I didn't chance to damage the string or hitting my forearm with it. Then, I kept drawing the bow into stance for a while. My arms and shoulders were starting to get sore. Despite what I'd seen in movies and TV, willowy people were not natural archers. The bow's draw took a lot of strength to get it back to the anchor point. We passed the morning this way, and if it weren't for the aliens and whatnot, it just seemed like we were on a camping trip together. Finally, I could see Keith was tiring out, so against his objections, he went back to bed, 
and kept trying to rattle off a list of stuff as he fell back asleep. It was mostly gibberish by the end. No matter how strong his mind might be, his body was at its limit. The Rothany and Keith were asleep. We were pretty stocked up on meat, so I decided to head out for some foraging. Keith had mumbled something about vines, so I figured he had plans for them. Grabbing the container shell with the harness, my hatchet, and knife, I headed out. Maybe I could have taken the bow with me, but realistically I'm not a good enough shot yet, and we only had three arrows left and I didn't want to risk them. Time to take a walk in the woods. At first, I started by following my own trails that I'd been marking. It was pretty simple, some cuts on trees that were easily discerned. Another mark if I saw something of interest. Just enough to be able to steer and not end up lost. I'd been heading up mountain from the bluff, having no other particular direction to try, and it had panned out fairly well thus far. I located some more of the yams, discarded the off-color ones, and put the rest in my container. The yams were the most important. Potato plants of all kinds are nutrient-dense, meaning that even a single yam was a lot of bang for your buck. Remembering my dietary training from when I was competing, calories were important, but here it was reversed. Rather than what most people would do and try to stay to 2,000 calories or less, we were both essentially cross-training, expending absurd calories. On the daily, I estimated we'd need 5,000 calories apiece to maintain weight. We needed to retain fat, but how to get there? Let's do some math on that. 5,000 calories a day, split between three meals? So, 1,667 calories per meal. One yam is 162 calories each. A large steak, such as the ones we got off the cougar, is 685 calories, so that would leave 820 calories up for grabs for just one meal. The broths are providing at least some calories on top of that, along with some extra nutrients, but we're still running short, given how much work we're doing. We had to increase intake, we needed beans and other calorie adds, alongside things like mushrooms, fiber vegetables, and at least one source citrus. The float fish had been closest to salmon, and if I remember correctly, 121 calories per 3 ounces. We've been using around 6 ounces. Cuts, putting it to 242. 578 calories left to go if I keep it all together. The best part for that would be something like granola, giving me 597 calories per cup, and it would be portable to allow for snacking while we're on the trail. Problem is, no granola as far as I've seen. So where do I get the calories? Nuts and seeds, I'm guessing. Hmm, there would probably be something like pine nuts around. And those are around 190 calories per ounce. Problem is season. I took a break, unshouldering the harness, and sat down to read the fauna guide. Nuts would be a great ad, but they don't generally ripen until late summer to early fall. And so far, most seasonal points have remained the same between here and Earth. So let's take a look here. Grains are out. Great long term, but that's seasons off, and unless we hit the mother load in one go, their planting season would be essentially over before we could plant them in an amount that matters. Checking the section on nuts, it was similarly problematic. They wouldn't be ready to harvest for months yet, so even knowing where to get them just wouldn't matter for a while yet. Looking through the section of vegetables, there were a few that stood out, some leafy greens, tubers, it was a pretty solid arrangement. I'd need to get as much as possible. I went back over the list, looking at the pictures. And wait, I've seen those plants. Those were producing beans? I'd been more on the lookout for yams at first. I worked my way slowly back along my path, checking my marks. I also found a couple of spice plants, something akin to mint. Rather than pick them, I used my knife to break the ground around the plant and took three whole plants with me, pouring some of my water right onto the roots before continuing on. I did finally find the plant I was looking for, a whole field of them. Near the edge of the field was a white moss. Checking the book, it was edible as well. I took the bean plants, the moss, roots included. The shell was getting heavy to pull, and marking the area, I started heading back when I heard the beep. My green light was blinking, and needing a break, I hid it and sat on the edge of the container shell. It was Annabelle. Afternoon, Val. Hi, Annabelle. What can I help you with? I was huffing and puffing a bit, but put on my best time to talk to the camera's face. Today, I wanted to talk to you about the fight yesterday with Keith's dire cougar. 
we know that you, as well as all the competitors, saw how the fight went down. What were your feelings? Annabelle had the determination of a reporter asking a teammate how they felt seeing someone else make a great play. I took a swig from my bottle before answering. It was terrifying. I mean, I didn't know exactly where they were, so even if I'd tried to go save him, I doubt it would have worked, even if I could reach them in time. Watching, it was insane. Keith's a big guy, and he still looked like some deranged mouse charging a cat. The thought made me sick, and I wasn't just acting on that front. Worse was watching as every arrow hit, and it didn't stop the thing. Even with nine arrows in it, it was still absolutely deadly. And then Keith took the hit from the paw, and my heart stopped as he slammed into the tree. Honestly, I don't know how he got up from that hit, let alone kept fighting, and then walked the whole way back. She was following along as I spoke, making sure to do the expected acknowledgments of a seasoned interviewer as I went along, then responded. And with Keith sidelined, how much do you feel that hurts your chances? Is Keith even capable to keep going? I frowned. Fact is, yeah, it hurt us more than I probably realize. This stuff... I gestured around at the forest around me. This is his domain. It's right in his wheelhouse, not mine. I've been to tourist campgrounds before, but never anything like this. Him being out of it for now is a major gut punch. But he's still working. He'll keep going and do whatever he can do. I know that in my heart. Whatever else, he's able to spread his knowledge to others to teach us to do what he can't. Annabelle nodded poignantly as I talked, waiting for me to get to a proper point to jump in. Speaking of those feelings, we've seen some various bit of maybe flirting between the two of you. I sat back, putting my arms back on the edges of the shell behind me. The concept of this moment was crazy, that the fate of humanity in some way rested on the idea that people out there in the galaxy might be interested in a romance subplot for a reality show. I mean, come on. He's not exactly hard on the eyes. He's respectful, competent, and he genuinely cares about others, even strangers, speaking of Ragnar and Greltha. Even he knows he'd have been better off in the competition to let them get eliminated. Hell, leaving me behind at the start could have saved him some work. Annabelle considered for a moment. Speaking to that thought, we all heard Keith's declaration that he would protect them all. I'm curious, what are your feelings on the matter? Ah, here was the true question. Do I support his attempt or not? I shrugged. The Rothani have proven themselves useful already, expanding our smokehouse, tanning leather. As to the sentiment, I stand with him. Yeah, I wish he'd talk to me about it first. But really, once you get to know him, it was always going to go this way. It was just a matter of time. It's like getting mad at a dog for barking. His whole career's been protecting lives, whether in the army or with the EMTs. Aside from that, he's known too much loss. He's got no right to be as sane as he is, to still see the light like he does. He's had his whole life ripped apart again and again, and somehow it seems like every time he got kinder, more compassionate. If he was a total jerk, some curmudgeon recluse, and you heard his story, you'd just be like, ah, that explains it. But he isn't, and I don't think it's in him to be that guy. Admittedly, we haven't been here that long, but in all our conversations, he's still got that absolute certainty that we'll win this, even now. I competed at the national and world level, and I'll be honest, I've never seen anyone that strong. Even the Rathani seem to get it, that he's different. And I'm certain the folks at home are seeing it too. Last night, I asked him privately about some stuff, if we could really get away with his threat, and he looked me dead in eyes and said, we are the species of fuck around and find out. They made the biggest mistake starting this shit with us. And I mean, is he wrong? Annabelle legitimately laughed at the last bit. Not at all, as far as I know. What are your plans from here? Well, I've been out gathering today, since I know we're pretty flush with meat. Now it's time to get growing things. It's a calorie game, and I've been doing the math. With the amount of work we're having to do, we need a lot more calories to maintain our weight and fat reserves. So, as impressive as it might be for me to just go out hunting like Keith would, right here and now, I need to focus on filling out around the catch we've already got. We've got edible moss, something like mint, yams, and beans. 
there's a bunch here to use, and a bunch we'll need to plant. We can't just think about the meal right in front of us. As Keith put it, we need to stop surviving. Survival is temporary, and we can't think that way. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a load to get back to camp, I said, getting the harness back in place, and hit the green button before setting off again. I heard the distinct sounds of a tree going down up ahead of me as I was nearing camp, and held up for a second. A few minutes later, I heard it again from the same general direction. As I approached, the source was unexpected. Greltha. She was literally just walking up to some of the thinner trees and pushing them down, bringing up the stump and roots with it. Jesus Christ. Greltha, hold up a minute. Greltha halted at their name and turned, waving to me. Greetings, Lady Val. It seems you've had a very productive day. Ragnar and myself decided to get an early start to the night. I took another deserved rest. Yeah, it's gone well. Got some stuff we can use immediately, and more stuff we can plant. What's with the tree pushing? Is Ragnar going to help you with this? Greltha had a toothy grin. Ragnar's already made a couple of trips, but he's more useful in domestic pursuits. He is working on shelter with Keith. I should get back to work. We'll need to get our shelters in order quickly before the rains come and slow us down. I continued on, and start to hear music. Keith was sitting at the cooking pot and singing country songs. The current one was The River. Next to him, providing a rhythm, was Ragnar, stripping down the trees Greltha was felling. Ragnar rose as soon as he saw me to help me get the container shell the rest of the way up. They were quite strong as a species. Welcome back, Lady Val. Can I get you some water? I almost said no, but honestly, water sounded great, and I was tired as hell. The camp was different again. Now, there were little stakes in the ground all over the place, marking out places to put support pieces, and a growing stack of logs for lumber. Some of the wood had been set over by the Rothany's shelter, and as I came up by the fire, Keith passed me a bowl of stew he'd worked on. It was pretty good, could use salt, but that was sort of a recurring issue here. Hey, Keith. Is there a way to get salt? He considered a moment. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's possible, strictly speaking. Easiest way for us is to get access to seawater. Then, what you do is, you put seawater in a stock pot and boil her down till what you got left looks like wet sand. From there, you take it off the heat and let it dry. Bam, sea salt. Seems simple enough. How much would we need? He scratched his chin for a moment and I noticed for the first time that there was only scruff on his chin and above his mouth. Was he shaving with his survival knife? He finished his thought. Well, on Earth, five gallons will get you about four cups of salt, but then our oceans are less salinized than they used to be, so yield might be higher here. It's a good catch. Salt and stuff is a good way to preserve stuff. Also, stuff tastes better. Got other stuff we gotta do first, though. I nodded. The shelter. He shook his head. There's that but that's going to be me and Ragnar. We got another thing, and you should take Greltha with you for it. Need you to start taking things to the other species here. Start showing them we don't need to be fighting each other. I'd do it, but I'm getting winded going to the bathroom right now. I gotta have me a talk with Annabelle. That shook me. Of course, I knew that his plan was to bring on the others, but I'd assumed that was on hold until he was better. But, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing with that. I'd love to do that, hun. But truth of the matter is, it can't wait. My shoulder will take months to heal, and there's the ribs. Yeah, sure. Today we didn't have any eliminations, but that ain't gonna stay that way. Whenever the weather starts turning on us, we're gonna lose, folks, and we need to get to him before that, he said in his usual matter-of-fact way. From there, he got up and walked up to the bluff's edge, slowly trudging up to his spot, and I went along. The boon bags from earlier had been gathered here and laid out, each one had its own alphabet on it, none of it in English. He pressed the green button on his wristband as he sat down, and Annabelle came up on screen. Evening, Miss Annabelle. I'm needing a minute of your time if it's not too much trouble. Annabelle was quick to respond. I'd be happy to help, Keith. But before that, I was trying to do an interview with you earlier. Unfortunately, you were asleep most of the day, which I understand, given yesterday's events. Do you have time now? Sure thing, darling. But first, my business. I need to know who sent us each of the boon bags. When we're done with that, then I'll answer any questions you care to ask me. Just be sure you want the answers. He smiled as he said, 
but with a definite glint in his eyes. Keith was down an arm, panting from the effort of coming up the hill, and somehow he still looked like he was ready to fight. Annabelle and Keith went through the bags, nineteen in all. As she went over the names of the various species, Keith had me write them down, using a small piece of charcoal, and the remains of the pizza box, the Vendrix, Goal, Vrasti, Trills, Keith laughed a quick second at that one, Skrens, Bausuts, Dongain, Hilgos, Anzoth, Trondrox, Ajex, Olzul, Enod, Dohar, Gemnins, Aislir, Krutals, Asu, and Virgils. With each name she brought up a still image of the species, clearly from promotional materials from the games. Once we had names, and some faces to put to them, Keith asked about getting some views of the species talking. I didn't understand why he did it until I started to understand the words a bit. Keith had figured out the trick for our nanites. They wouldn't necessarily know the difference between an alien's true voice and what they were hearing from the screen. He had Annabelle replaying bits until we both had full sentences coming from each. He was cheating the game, making it possible for us to understand their words, and had made sure I was there for it. All right now, one last thing. I assume in that you've watched what's going on, more than just our end of things. Can you tell me who of those are in the worst shape right now? Annabelle smiled. She was on to the game now. Well, obviously you two are in the lead, and until yesterday, the Rothani were dead last, expected to be the next ones out. They're placed second now that they're working with you. After that, the Aislir are doing the best. Annabelle laid out the rankings. It went us, the Rothani, the Aislir, Skrens, Hilgos, all the way down down to the Asu and Virgal, who were struggling. And again, as she talked about the species, the footage came up, promotional material of the species, and I could see the wheels turning in Keith's head. He was noting landmarks. He'd just gotten Annabelle to, without asking, get at least basic languages for our nanites, faces to put to the species, and with landmarks, where about these species were. Direct questions like that would have likely been a negative, but he'd talked around it. There was a certain aspect to how his mind worked that could be terrifying at times. When it was finished and I had everything marked down, Keith sat back. Now, Miss Annabelle, you've done hell to your word, so I reckon I owe you some interview time. Val, I know you've had yourself a hell of a long day, so just have Ragnar bring up the vines, and I'll get myself to what work I can do, while I do my confessional thing. The look he passed me told the story. He needed me out of the shot, now that he'd pulled off his trick. If there was blowback, he didn't want it hitting me. I took my pizza box of names and left him to his interview. I let Ragnar know to bring him the vines and check the shower. The bladder was already full, and I went inside the small confines to have a well-earned cleaning and engaged privacy mode. A hot shower helped not only physically but mentally as well. I was in so much better a mood as I came out of the shower and turned off privacy mode. I stepped into the tent to change clothing and saw something on my bed. A small bouquet of flowers, tied together with stems the same way we would make flower crowns on earth. For Keith to have made this would have been a ton of work for him, and it was incredibly sweet. I know it's stupid and girly, but I just sat there for a bit, grinning like an idiot and sniffing the bouquet. Guys didn't really get me flowers. Yeah, the occasional thing from my dad, but I mean that doesn't really count, and it was only for big stuff, like graduating high school. Aside from that, though, it just wasn't a thing, largely due to my athleticism, as most guys assumed that. Because of my liking sports, that meant flowers were out. Getting dressed, I went out, and it seemed that Ragnar and Keith were in the middle of a project here at the end of the day. Keith was whittling a small piece of wood, while Ragnar was... smoking? How the... Keith, are you making a pipe? Keith turned from where he sat at the fire, smiling. Yep. So, as it turns out, the Rothani, much like some of our own Native American tribes, have a custom with smoking. So I figure, why not embrace it? Pop-Pop used to make these kinds of things, along with duck decoys. Pull up a seat. But... There isn't any tobacco, I said, looking around. He did a sort of head bob. Nah. You don't necessarily need to Baku. That's just what us humans came to for our regular smoking needs. There were some weeds in the guide that work for it. But it's good you're here. Greltha just got back, and I want to try a trick. Keith called out over the waterfall side of the bluff for Greltha, who came up carrying a fish and a water container. 
When she arrived, Keith moved to a catch on his wristband and took it off. All right, time for an experiment. Ragnar, put this on, and if the green light beeps and lights up, press it. Here, something went off. Both Ragnar and Greltha, for the first time, looked angry, and it was sudden. Keith pulled back the wristband. I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to cause offense. Greltha caught her breath a second, then replied. We know that, Keith. But for the Rothani, to bind one's wrists in shackles is the gravest offense. On Rothan, our homeworld, there were once invaders who enslaved our race for a long time, and it has stuck with us. Keith nodded slowly. I'm really sorry about that, but that's not what this is. Y'all destroyed your wristbands on the first day. The wristbands let you get your survival gear, boons from your people, and talk with your species council. They can be taken off whenever, but that's why you guys never got supplies to start with. I wanted to see if using the wristband could at least get y'all your things. It'd give us a ton of ability to move forward on stuff if we're not having to split gear. I promise, you can take it off immediately afterward, but just for the moment, please wear it. Ragnar and Greltha looked to each other, and it was Greltha who stepped forward, taking the offered wristband and put it on. Sure enough, as soon as it resized, the green button lit up and the beep sounded. Greltha pressed the button, and a container appeared, this time with what I had to assume was Greltha's name on it, and a screen popped up with one of her own people there, much as Annabelle had been for us. They went over things, the same as they did with us. It was kind of perversely hilarious watching it, and Greltha opened her container, seeing the contents again, much the same as our on. Next, she removed the wristband and passed it to Ragnar, who repeated the process, then returned the wristband to Keith. We'd just doubled our effective tools for survival, and Keith had an incredibly self-satisfied grin on his face. His words from the other day came back, you have to know when to break the rules. Somewhere along, Keith had stopped playing the game and was now actively playing against it. The strange thing was, we hadn't heard from Ravage Atik since then, had received no censure by whatever counted as referees, and we were still receiving items as normal, and the communication with Annabelle was still working. Keith was flipping them all off repeatedly with malice of forethought now, and they still had yet to come back at him about it. Did they just not realize, or did they not get why he'd do it? There were a lot of questions with no attainable answers in the foreseeable future. Keith and Ragnar finished up their whittling of pipes, then sat smoking some sort of local weed together with Greltha. I certainly wasn't taking up smoking right now, but they all looked really happy, just relaxing, having a smoke by a warm fire. Even though they were essentially playing, you only had to look around the camp to see that progress had been made. Greltha's trees that she'd pushed down had been stripped of branches and stacked, though not broken down into logs yet. Looking at the trees, Greltha at least was far stronger than any human I've ever seen. After their smoke break, we did some basic prep work, taking vines, pulling them apart, and then weaving them back together as three-strand rope. While we certainly had paracord and rope, Keith wanted to be as economical with it as possible, and thus, making new ropes for use was a priority. I think it also gave him something he could do, even as injured as he was, though I was aware he had to take somewhat frequent breaks, generally either the shoulder or his ribs making even small tasks take noticeably longer. Again, I wasn't about to complain, and with the Rothani helping, he wasn't directly needed for his physical skills. He would be weeks on the mend, but he seemed to be trying to do what he could, which was an encouraging sign. Eventually, with as much done as we figured we could get to, it was time to get to bed. I helped Keith into his hammock, but apparently... He had a little bit more to talk about. Val, in the morning, you and Grelth are heading out. We need to be making contact with the other species, get any that'll come back. I'd do it, but I'm getting winded when I go down to take a leak, let alone any larger trek. Keith, this is your plan. I don't know what I'd be doing, I replied, sitting on my own hammock. He paused for breath. Sure you do. They ain't that much different than us. Come right down to it. They're all just trying to survive this thing and keep their people out of chains. You were an office manager before, right? I need you to headhunt the other species and convince them we're their best bet. This is something you're already skilled at. We need to find the Virgil and the Asu first, since it seems they're not faring too well. I hadn't really thought about it like that. For all that all these various species were very visibly different than us. 
they were trying to do the same thing as we were. The same basics of life were true throughout the competition. Safe drinking water, a safe warm place to sleep, and food. It didn't really require much else to get started. I pulled out the pizza box. All right. The Virgil are the lizard people, right? Keith considered. Yeah, but I'd reckon they're more like stegosaurs with the backplates. The Asu are the upright bunny folk. They might be a bit harder, because they're fast, and I'm pretty sure they're herbivores. Wait, but if they're herbivores, wouldn't that make them less of a threat? I paused. Hell no. A bear will run away from yelling hey bear at it and banging some pots. A moose or elk, if they think they can take you, they'll fuck your world up. Predator animals are fundamentally lazy. They don't want to fight you to kill you. It's all about conserving energy for them. He chuckled a bit and winced shortly after. We went over some more details before I laid down and went to sleep. I was woken just before dawn by Greltha, who was wearing her own pack and gear. Miss Val, it is time to depart. We have a long journey ahead of us. I got up, stretching, and like Greltha, packed up items. I sifted through the boon bags, finding the symbols that had displayed with the Asu and the Virgil, and we headed out. Checking the bags, there was a hand-woven length of red cloth, with gold filigree, bearing three gold claw marks in the middle for the Virgil. For the Asu, it was a sort of beaded choker. I put the choker on and hung the cloth over my backpack, hoping that they would see them and give us a moment to talk and get to understand our language. Once we were down the bluff and walking, Greltha began up a conversation that I wasn't intrinsically ready for. Miss Val, is Keith your mate? Wow, that was fast. No, we're not. But you are attracted to him? She replied, though it was more a statement than a question, really. I took a breath. Yeah, I am. But I mean, aside from all the we-could-die-at-any-moment stuff, there are, uh, other concerns. Greltha cocked her head slightly. My people would say that the immediacy of our potential deaths is a reason to tell him. But what are the other concerns? Sighing, I silently decided fuck it. And I went over most of what I'd already told Keith. And at the end... I got abandoned by the last man I trusted. And... I know I have trust issues. Greltha considered a moment. I have not known him that long. But I would say that Keith is not the sort to abandon anyone. My proof of that is his injuries our presence in your tribe, and our mission to find others to bring into his tribe. I shook my head. Greltha, I get that. By all logic and reason, Keith would never leave me. He wouldn't leave anyone. But emotionally, I'm scared. There's this song on Earth, Because of You, and I think there's kind of a point in one of the lyrics. Because of you? I don't know how to let anyone else in. Before all of this, yeah, I'd have gotten together with him. Without blinking. Even when I consider my daughter, I can't imagine him as anything other than a great dad. But I still can't even trust my own feelings, my own logic. And I know it's stupid and weak, but it's still there. And even aside from my own stuff, Keith has just a pile of trauma, and that makes the feelings worse. Greltha signaled a break as we walked and sipped at her water. What sort of trauma? Keith has lost his parents, his grandparents, friends he served with, and then lost his wife and daughter. And it's selfish, I grant that. But I mean, any one trauma in his life is worse than everything I've ever been through. And I had people, I had support. He's repeatedly been left alone his whole life, and it's there. He panicked awake the morning of the attack, had a full-blown panic attack, and it took time to get him back under control. Not that he was violent. He was just screaming for me like he thought I'd died. I think it was him talking about it. I did a basic psychology course in college, and we did study PTSD for a bit. It's a concept called moral injury. Something happens that's so horrific that it maims who you are as a person. Then when they broadcast the cougar fight, he yelled about how the universe didn't get to take one more thing from him, and if I'm honest, I don't know if he was even aware of you in that moment. I don't even get how he's still standing as a person, let alone trying to take care of everyone here. Any one of his traumas is worse than everything that's ever happened to me in my entire life, and I just... I don't know how can be as sane as he is. When I looked up, the fur under Greltha's eyes was wet with tears. Nor can I. For the Rathani, family is all. 
Many of our kind would have died from the grief of so much being torn away from them, and yet he stands. I didn't understand what he was screaming at the cougar at the time, but it makes sense, given the context you've given to it. We should keep moving, however. We got up, and for a time, neither of us felt much like talking. We passed back through a very quiet forest. The various prey animals were likely avoiding the area, given the leftover sense of blood as we got closer to where the fight had happened. Greltha waved off, taking a break. She didn't want to dwell back there, and I fully understood the feeling as I shared it. I had nearly watched as Keith died, and I can only imagine that feeling magnified in the two Rothani that had been hunted by that thing. While we did keep moving, I did look around. The last time I had come along these paths, I'd been running for the bluff, and I hadn't really had time to properly explore, and without the little booklets, that search wouldn't have meant much. Certainly I'd looked from the treetop, but that was more in the vein of locating somewhere to make camp. Now I looked around at the lavender grass, the trees, vines, moss, and budding flowers. The walk wasn't unpleasant, and were we not fighting for our lives and the freedom of our species, it would have been quite a fun day excursion. While it was cool out, the survival gear we'd been given was enough to keep the chill off of us. The sun was getting higher in the sky, and I estimated it would be around this planet's equivalent of 10 a.m. as Greltha called a halt, sniffing the air. I can smell others. Turning about, I looked for landmarks, the ones Keith had tricked out of Annabelle, and I could just see them to the north. Following Greltha's lead, we tracked through some brush until I started noticing little disturbances, a small broken branch here, or some odd footprints there. Greltha seemed to know where she was going, so I made it my job to mark the trees as we passed creating a way for us to find our way back easily, each mark at shoulder height so I could feel them, even if I couldn't see them. As we came upon a small cul-de-sac, naturally formed between small hills, fallen logs, and the like. They are here, the Virgil. I can smell large lizard creatures. I nodded and took the red banner off my backpack, having Greltha hold it up while I called out, My name is Val. We mean you no harm. We have food with us if you're hungry, and water if you're thirsty. The first peeked its head out. Its head was almost completely smooth, save for the rounded bits of bone that would become a trail of stegosaur plates going down its back, almost to the tail. It seemed scared at first, until it saw the banner, then it disappeared back inside the cul-de-sac. It had made no motion for us to follow, so I simply called out my message again and again. Greltha assured me that they were still in there. The cul-de-sac was defensible, but it also meant that there was no other quick exit to it. After several minutes of calling, two came out, and while I'm certainly not a xenobiologist, it was pretty clear that these two were in no shape to fight us. They were thin, too thin, and I could just see ribs as they exhaled. They had likely not eaten in some time, and remembering them from the beach, they hadn't looked particularly well-fed then. They were still nervous and staying quiet, so as I repeated my message again, softer this time, I made a show of setting down my hatchet and knife, while Greltha made an offering gesture with the banner, making certain that it did not touch the ground. Finally one spoke. What is it you want? We have no trade. Keith's trick had worked. I removed my backpack and got out two fish. We're not here to trade. We want you to come with us. You both look hungry. Is this food for you? They both made a clicking noise, and their tongues automatically peeked out. The smaller one tried to move forward, but was halted where they stood by the larger one. Why would you help us? This hurts you. It hurts your species. I sighed. This would take a while, and I hit privacy mode for a moment. I wouldn't, but Keith, who leads us, has a strategy to beat the game, not just for us, but for everyone. I don't know if you heard about this from your council, but Keith killed the giant cat and swore to every species watching that he would protect everyone, and then threatened Ravage Teak. Maybe it was the wrong move, but holding back could hurt us with the other species, who already distrusted us, so speaking truthfully seemed the best bet. I shut off privacy mode, and as I awaited a response, I laid down the two fish on a stone, eating a small piece along with a bottle containing cougar bone broth that I took a sip from, and signaled Greltha to move back with me, stepping away, and even leaving my weapons in their reach. Every step back was nerve-wracking. How does Keith keep doing this shit? Either one of them could knock out half of the lead team in one swift move and we were handing it to them. 
When we were ten paces back, the smaller one shot forward, ignoring hatchet and knife to start eating the fish and gulping down the broth. It's amazing. How do humans make this? Before I could answer, the taller one rushed over and lightly slapped the smaller one. Chathuxel! It could be poisoned! What hadn't translated must have been the small one's name. Chithuxil? Did I say that right? I'm Val, and I promise you both, we really mean no harm. I tried both, so I'd be just as poisoned. Keith, my partner, is a medic, a healer, and he has an oath to render aid, one he can't convince himself to deny, even in this death game. This seemed to move the bigger one, who was now considering Grelfa, and paying special attention to the bandaging on her arm. Keith, he did that for you? Grelfa held up the bandaged arm. I am Grelfa, of the Rathani. Yes, as soon as we were back to his camp. He gravely injured himself in the fight to save us, but he fed me, and my mate checked us for wounds and helped us to make shelter. He threatened Ravajtik and swore to all our homes to protect us all and ask our species for elements to prove that his intentions were peaceful. This banner was sent by your people. The taller made its first move toward us, cautiously, but putting themselves between Chatuxel and us. I am Azoku, and that banner is the banner of my clan. I considered for a moment, and there was something between the two Virgil. Is Chatuxel your child? Azoku straightened to full height. He is my son, yes. I took a small step forward. I am a mother myself, and I swear on my daughter, we are not your enemy. The Cathral are. They brought us here, they pitted us against each other, and they are the ones threatening to enslave our peoples. Azoku looked me in the eyes, pondering and judging me for a moment before responding, and it felt much longer than it likely was. I understood Azoku completely on this. They would be betting their son's life, their species' freedom, on one random human. Finally, Azoku let out a slow breath. We accept this. How do we proceed? I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding, as did Grelta. For one, eat slowly and drink up. I need to find the Asu next. They're... rabbit-like people with long ears. And they're herbivores. Have you seen them recently? Azoku and Chathusel both hissed in obvious displeasure. Yes, we know the thieves. They raided our supplies mere hours after we received them. We would prefer not to work with them, as they cannot be trusted. I nodded. I get that feeling of betrayal, Azoku. More than you know. But this is bigger than any of us. For Keith's strategy to work, we need everyone, and the Asu are in desperate straits themselves, and that might be why they took your supplies. Do you have any idea where they are? Chathoxel answered first, pointing. Yeah, they made a burrow about a mile that way. Azoku turned on him, glowering, but Chathuxel made a head-bobbing maneuver. What? If the Asu makes a move, the humans are powerful hunters. She'll just kill them. So what's to lose, father? Powerful hunters? The footage. They'd watched Keith against the cougar. Was the cougar something that was beyond their strength? I looked to Grelta, but she just nodded sagely at the idea, seemingly of the same mindset regarding humans. Did they think we were all like him? Wait, were we in comparison? Certainly the Rothani had advantages we didn't, like their strength and their sense of smell. But now, two different races were according to us as a significant threat. Even now, the Virgil were treating me like a dangerous predator, even if they were willing to work with us. A deranged mouse charging a cat. Ruminations for later. All right, you already have an issue with the Asu. Grelta, you stay here with them until they're ready to travel and bring them back to camp. I'm heading after the Asu. Grelta nodded. Travel well. I will see to the newest members of our tribe. I would not be able to keep up with you if we were to travel together, and the Asu are fast. With that, I traded items with Grelta and headed out in the direction I'd been given, continuing to mark the trees as I went. I kept a weather eye out, since the Asu were apparently looting other survivors. Thank God for the warning, because otherwise I might have missed the one slipping up on me. Thankfully, she came just within my peripheral vision. As she grabbed for my water bottle, I twisted and caught her wrist on instinct. The Asu were small, even compared against me. She only came up to my shoulders, and from the way she was pulling, her strength was like that of a twelve-year-old's. She wouldn't be able to break my grip. Her fur was mottled browns and grays, with white at the front, and her eyes were pink, 
slightly pointed out to the sides. Hey now, we don't need to be stealing. I took the water bottle off my belt and offered it to her as she struggled. I'm Val. I just want to talk. I handed her the bottle, which she took, and then I made a mistake. Assuming that she would listen, I let go of her wrist, and she immediately sprinted away. Fuck! I gave chase as the button on my wristband began to beep, but Greltha was right, they were fast. I might have broken off pursuit, but I remembered something. She was a sprinter. Sprinters are incredibly fast, sure, but I could run longer, and she couldn't hide her path. So there I went, crashing through the same brush she was hopping through, and stayed on her, relying more on my ears to tell me direction. The Asu took a zigzagging path, but the problem with that strategy is it's a pattern. I just needed to overtake her, and while I might not be a survivalist like Keith, I could run a triathlon. I stayed with her and began to realize how she was moving, closing the gap little by little, until finally we arrived at a river that she bounded over in a single leap, and stopped, assuming I wouldn't be able to clear the river. She was breathing incredibly heavily, and she was... sort of right. I couldn't clear the entire river. I didn't have to, though, and I jumped, landing on a tall stump just long enough to Kong leap off of it and used a branch hanging over the river to swing for the height and distance I needed. Instead of landing, I tucked and rolled, coming to my feet just in time to dodge as her partner Asu came in from the side, wielding a knife. I rolled away and swept with my leg, tripping him up for a moment, trying to keep talking as best I could, calling out my name and that we just needed to talk. I tried to get distance, backing slowly toward a nearby tree, but the male was back up and leapt at me. I changed tactics, running at the tree, hopping and kipping off of it, and caught a vine, turning it into a swing. He hopped as well and bounded off the tree, but now I was swinging back. I bent to force more power into my swing and laid out as I was, both feet connected with his chest, stopping all of his momentum. At the height of the swing back, I flipped backward and hit the ground, one knee hitting the dirt along with my fist as the other came to rest on my bent knee. We just need to talk. Look. I rose and pulled the front of my jacket down, revealing the choker to him. His eyes got wide from where he laid on the ground, and he kept saying something at me in a gasping, chittering language I couldn't grasp, and then at the female one who had barely moved from where she was at. She was wincing from breathing hard, but when she caught sight of my choker, she knelt prostrate, and the male moved to match as soon as he was able. The achievement window popped up. The champion. That would mean an advantage, and it was my first achievement since the Valiant on day one. I admit it felt pretty good. Go figure, an athlete being excited about a prize they won. I kept going over my introduction until they started to get the recognition and told them to start talking, that I would pick up what they were saying. This took a minute, but the nanites finally started doing their job, as the female spoke. Please, don't kill my brother. I was breathing hard as well as the adrenaline dropped off. I'm not here to hurt either of you. I'm Val. I want the Asu to join our tribe. There are six in our tribe now, and you two make eight. I have food and water to share with you. Get up. Fuck, that was a workout. What are your names? The Asu rose as commanded, the male rising slower, but still obeying the command. The female continued to be the one who spoke as her companion seemed to be trying to remember how to breathe. I am Duketha, and this is my brother Shin. We did not know you were on the authority of the Empress. Empress? Well, okay then, good to know. Apparently, your Empress sent this to us so that we could save the two of you. I'm sorry for hitting you, Shin, but if it's all the same, I'm a little tired to explain. We can rest up a minute, and then I need to lead you both back to our camp. Is your burrow near here? We can get your things, and I can help carry them, but it's going to be getting late in the day by the time we get back. There's more food and water at our camp. We ended up resting about an hour. Shin wasn't seriously injured, all things considered, but there would definitely be bruises in the shape of my boots. We gathered up their survival gear, plus some other species' survival gear that they'd made off with in the course of things. Loaded up, we began the march back until we picked up my trail of markers, from which, it was a simple enough matter, it just took forever. The Asu needed frequent breaks, and while I understood, it still made the trip back much slower. I learned more about them. They were siblings, from the planet Asur. Their people had united under their version of the Roman Empire, 
called the Asuran Empire, something like a thousand years or so back. By the way they spoke about their empress, she was a near deific figure to their people. Shin was usually more verbose, but apparently if you get kicked hard enough in the chest, you really lose the desire to have long talks. By the time we made it back to the bluff, the sun was getting low. As we came up the switchback, things in the camp had changed again. There were now holes dug down the bluff at intervals, with a path between, and log posts had been placed in them, all coming to an essentially level point. And planks? There was a small stack of wooden planks over by where Ragnar, Keith, and the Virgil were sitting around the main campfire. Keith saw me, and sent Ragnar and Greltha to help bring up the equipment. As I sat down and took a well-earned bite of cougar and a lot of water, Keith was smiling. Really, Val? The superhero landing? The what? Keith explained superhero landing to me, and I did it on intergalactic TV. 8.1 billion people on Earth, and I'm guessing they watched it happen, let alone at least 25 other species, untold billions, or even trillions. I was slightly mortified at the concept, but at the same time that means Cassie saw her mom do it too. Then there's Keith himself. While I know that fight had to have taken it out of him, ever since, something was off with him. I couldn't quite place it, but the smiles were too at ease for someone with a dislocated shoulder, bruised ribs, and only a day past having a full-blown panic attack and then nearly dying. That rage when he'd threatened Ravaj Teak was genuine, raw, and the smiling man felt like a put-on, an act. The problem was the game. It might well be an act, a play to further play a game. The one smile of his that had seemed genuine since the incident was when he got Ragnar and Greltha their equipment, when he'd successfully put together something, but I didn't know what it might be. I couldn't bother with investigation, though. Like it or not, neither he nor I could truly be completely honest with the cameras on, and Keith was playing an internal game, only giving out information when it was time. By Ragnar and Greltha's stories, Keith had gotten back to talking to the audience, explaining various elements of what they were doing, and leaning into his accent for Uncle Keith's survival hour. He was also doing more interviews with Annabelle, tonight including our newest members in the interviews, introducing them as his tribe mates. And the most I could do in this moment was to play along, afraid to trust men, and forced to just keep trusting him while he made his plays. What were mine? Since we'd begun, all that I had done was follow Keith, but he was injured, emotionally scarred, and having to pay attention to things I couldn't properly conceive of. There had to be something I could do, something that he couldn't do, something to stand out. What can I do? I've got strength, endurance, cooking skills, and two bunny people who will do whatever I say. Oh God, I'm so stupid. I'm a manager. First, I went to the location where my achievement reward had materialized, and inside it was a long saw blade with handles at either end, along with a longer, larger axe than the hatchets we'd been using. Distinctly useful, but not really in my own wheelhouse. That was fine. I went back to the fire with everyone seated. All right, we've had dinner, and a much-needed and deserved chance to relax. We need to start working out how we operate together. First off, I know the Rothani are generally nocturnal. Humans are able to operate either way. But what about the rest of you? Azoku answered first. We are most active in daylight, but we do have strong eyes at night when we need to. However, we have encountered issues here. Our species does not adapt well with sudden changes in temperature. Usually, we would be able to simply make certain that our homes are even of temperature, but we have had little luck with that here, and have been unable to get proper rest since this tournament began. This is irrespective of other competitors and threats that this world presents. If this state continues, we will begin to slip mentally. I nodded and looked to the Asub. And what of you two? Shin, having had some time to rest his lungs, spoke up. Well, we're in the day too, but our vision is not good in the dark. Not if we want to be quick. Mostly our fur keeps us warm enough, but I'm afraid we're not meat eaters, so we need to find more stuff to eat. Keith said nothing, merely letting me have the floor. He had to trust me as much as I had to trust him. All right, here is the plan for our tribe. First and foremost, you and Chathuxel will be on hunting detail. Chathuxel nodded immediately, but Azoku gave me a discerning gaze. 
and why should I listen to one who does not hunt, and one who is now made cripple? Keith exchanged a questioning look, and it was Keith who responded, Well, I mean, the shoulder thing sucks, but I'll be able to start physical therapy in a few days, and then it's just a matter of weeks for I'm back to rights, I reckon. I'm hardly a cripple. Every alien around the fire turned to regard us, first Keith making the statement, then myself, looking for confirmation of whether that was true or false. It was Greltha who spoke first. That cannot be correct. It was my turn. Do... Do none of your species heal like us? I mean, some of our best athletes and fighters have come back from worse injuries than Keith's. I mean, it takes time and medical attention, but it's not abnormal for us. Keith, meanwhile, was taking half his shirt off, then pressed a button to take down the top half of his bodysuit. There was pain involved, but he did it, and I saw something I hadn't seen before. The scar of the bullet wound just below his right collarbone. I mean, y'all, this is from before I ever got here, and it nicked my right lung. Any of y'all think I slowed down from that? From what y'all know of me on this here planet? Duketha moved in close. That should kill you. It would kill any Asu. Azoku regarded it as well. While a strong Virgil might survive such a wound, they would never again serve as a warrior. Ragnar shook his head as well. This may be unique to your species. That is, a bit scary. I also have a question about the fight. I have not seen you display such strength since the fight. I know you are injured, but are humans really so strong? Even with our strength as Rothani, we were at the mercy of that creature, and yet... You were able to ignore much pain. Keith turning the suit piece back on. Well, I mean, once the adrenaline hits... Shin's ears perked. What's adrenaline? That wasn't the translator. It was Shin mimicking human speech at something that had no translation in his own language. We were both agape, and then Keith started laughing, then hissed, a hand going to his ribs. Oh shit, y'all, I hadn't considered that. Y'all don't know what adrenaline is. I mean, it makes sense. Not every species on Earth has an adrenal gland. Basically, it's a chemical that our bodies naturally produce, and it's introduced into our blood, giving us extra energy and whatnot. With it, we can get stronger, tougher, our pain tolerance goes up, and even get faster and get higher endurance. Heck, it was the adrenaline crash after I stopped moving that made me pass out. Val has it too, when she runs and stuff. Finally, the holographic screen popped up between us, and there was Ravajtik, but without any of the backgrounds for the games, and our privacy modes were all engaged. Survivor Keith, did I hear your statement correctly? And is this a special trait in certain humans? And there was that wolf-like smile again. Huh. Looks like somebody here didn't do their homework proper after all. Almost all humans produce adrenaline naturally. Had a buddy during an attack who got shot worse than I did, he just ran through, firing till he was out of ammo, then just fucking clubbed the guy to death. I mean, he nearly died of blood loss. But in the moment, we kind of refer to it as the superhero phase. Your garden variety humans use in, at most, 10% of their strength in a given moment. Once it hits, though, yeah, we get up to some shit. You got access to our internet? Look up, mother lifts car off baby and get back to me. Oh, and top 10 alien invasion movies of all time. The screen vanished and privacy mode dropped. Now Val was working on something? I snapped back to what we'd been discussing. Right. The Virgil are hunters, so they work as the tribe's hunters. Meanwhile, the Rothani have demonstrated the ability to be solid builders and will be depending on you to work during the nights. That leaves the Asu, and I have an important task for you both. I need you both to scout. Duketha looked downfallen. So they get to build stuff and hunt and we're just hopping around? I smiled. Don't take it hard. It's important. This is an alien world, and there may be more of that dire cougar out there, as well as other things. As Keith has imparted to me, information is key. We need to learn the land, especially where the other species are, any natural resources. Aside from that, we need to know any skills we all have. We've sort of gotten a refresher on human biology right now, but Keith's a skilled medic and survivalist, so he'll be here in case anything happens, and doing what he can while he heals and nothing else. Myself, I can switch between jobs, so I'll be helping out with each of you, doing gathering, helping us stay on target, as well as venturing out to find other species. The weather's been cooperative so far, but sooner or later, that changes. 
There was some more grumbling from Azoku, but with everyone else on board it seemed we had a strategy moving forward. Ragnar and Greltha excused themselves first, so Greltha could get in a nap before commencing night work. The Virgil went with them, and we handed them off the Afghans we'd received earlier, to help insulate them in the cold of the night. The Asu waited until I told them to go to sleep, and they found a spot of their own. That left me and Keith by ourselves for a bit, and I hit privacy mode. How's the shoulder and ribs? I mean, it hurts, but that's a good sign, medically speaking. If it weren't, that would point toward nerve damage. As to pain management, it looks like the oil in the bark of those Evereds is like birch bark, so I'm going to try the oil of it topically, to test if it's got the same pain relief properties. I mean, I've been taking stuff from my bag, but that's all the medical supplies we've got, and I don't want to burn through it if I don't have to, and I'd rather do the experiments while I still got supplies to deal with it if it goes wrong, he replied, letting the tiredness he was feeling show. I took one long breath and left off the rest of my questions for the night. All right, we should both get sleep. We've got a lot to do tomorrow. Things both sped up and slowed down from there. Keith wasn't sleeping well, sometimes at all, and several times awoke nearly screaming and crying from sleep. It was disconcerting, but he kept waving off the conversation, and it was clear I wasn't going to get him to budge. I'd read somewhere that one of the issues of PTSD was the inability to talk about the thing that caused it. He was sharp enough, but at the same time, something was tearing at him, and the forced stoppage had done something to him. I literally watched him breathe and force the tears to stop, and Greltha commented she had seen it too. She was worried, but there simply wasn't time to address it in the moment. Azoku was becoming a bit more of an issue. He and his son were proficient hunters, but he chaffed at having to obey the orders of others, and it became clear that he expected to be in a position of power. Chathuxil, meanwhile, seemed only too happy to impress us all, proudly displaying his kills. Something would need to be done, but whatever he was up to, he seemed to be waiting on something from Keith. Aside from scouting, the Asu had failed to mention a skill of theirs, thumping. They could actually communicate by slapping their large feet on the ground. It wasn't exactly a complicated speech, but it was another way of relaying information to one another. This gave us a massive advantage in not only knowledge of the land, but at least some sort of rapid communication system. Most of the time, Shin would go out while Duketha would stay nearer to camp and help where she could. One of those ways was in retrieving things for Keith, so he didn't need to move as much, as well as it turned out that the Asu were natural diggers. She began bringing up stones, which Keith told her how to place to make a primitive kiln, then had her bring up clay from the river. This was put into a mold for a bit that Keith had whittled out, and then bricks were steadily being fired. They weren't exactly top quality, but it was still moving toward a goal, to make a better kiln. Sheen, meanwhile, found more clay deposits downstream, while upstream he began bringing in bits of iron from the river, identifying the metal by scent. Ragnar and Greltha were moving forward with building and were making tremendous strides. They would wake up around mid-afternoon and get to work on bringing in lumber, while at night they would render them into shape for use, including stripping bark to make rope and making more wood planks. They even were grinding down what were essentially primitive nails, and then in the mornings, before going to sleep, they would do work on the frame for the decks that were discussed for the build. They even used rendered fat over a smoothed plank of wood, turning it into what was essentially a dry erase board, so Keith could better draw out plans for them. Each new shelter seemed to be getting built lower along the bluff, and with that, deeper posts. A rudimentary staircase had been built up as well, and the switchback was now covered with wood shavings, giving better traction, and railed, not that it would stop any serious amount of weight, but it was still better than nothing. For myself, I continued gathering using the flora book and worked as the hub for everyone else for information. In the three days since the Asu and Virgil had joined us, we had gotten amazing work done, and nowhere was that more glaring than in the glade. Ragnar and Greltha had essentially made a rock plow and were using it nightly when they had time to turn as much soil as they could. Then Duketha and Shin would come through with seeds and transplants. It brought up a new issue, irrigation. A point of personal enjoyment, though, was the soap that Keith had made finally set, and I could get properly clean for the first time since this started. I was a little despondent about the state of my body hair until I realized that Keith aside from a goatee coming in, was otherwise clean-shaven every day. 
Apparently he had been using his knife as a razor, and after a little practice, I got the knack down for myself. I know it's vain, and I can hear the voices of a thousand angry women, but I'd been shaving my legs for meats since my leg hair started growing in, like most serious track runners, and it was just an ingrained habit by this point. Then, one morning, something shifted. Shin had scented another species, and thumped a warning back to Duketha that they were approaching the bluff. Duketha looked at me. What do we do? I considered. Well, we're going to try and talk to them. We need all of us, not just a bunch of us. But let's not be silly about it. Have Shin retrieve the Virgil while I go down to meet with our potential tribe mates. I left out the part that could just as easily be here to kill us, but I'd gotten in trouble a lot when I was younger for saying the quiet parts out loud and learned from it. I went down our newly refurbished switchback, and I saw them entering the glade where they halted. If I remembered correctly from the clips we'd seen, they were called trills, and Keith had found something funny in the name that I didn't get. These were the first truly alien-looking creatures I'd seen. They were tall, reedy people, with no obvious gender between them. Their skin was hunter green, with large, yellow, ovoid eyes. I assumed they were keeping their mouths shut until I got close enough to realize they had neither noses, mouths, or ears in the typical sense. There did seem to be some sort of antennae that accomplished roughly the same goal. How do they communicate, though? We are telepathic. We speak with our minds, Valerie. I jumped and halted my approach. The voices, speaking in complete sync, came from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Then you can hear my thoughts now? They stood there still, unmoving, unblinking. We can, but your mind is cluttered. This is not a slight, but a statement that your species has not received conditioning to focus your minds. Your thoughts and feelings are scattered, but be not afraid. We come in peace. Take us to your leader. I may not know movies well, but even I knew that line, and I laughed unintentionally. They demonstrated their hands were empty as they continued to approach, and I continued to walk toward them. Sorry, but verbal speech works better for me. Does it help with your telepathy? Yes, as you speak, your mind focuses on the sounds you make. We wish to join you. Unlike the other species, these trills wore body suits akin to what Keith and I had on, which was likely understandable, as the others each had something like fur or scales to help them regulate temperature, and the Virgil's issue was with temperature regularity, it seemed, not the exact temperature itself. The Rothani were shedding their winter coats, as were the Asu. This still left some questions, though. What sort of food do trills eat? And what are your names? Our names have no vocal translation. I am, I got the feeling and mental image that I was seated before a warm hearth in the depth of winter. And I am, now, I felt and saw the image of coming home after a long time away. Our sustenance is no more than sun and water. We do not sleep, as your mind would put it. Though we do have states of dormancy, we are never unconscious. They really were our first true aliens, but oddly, the others had likely caused me to go along with this more. They seemed peaceful enough, and could never be a contest for food within the tribe. Their telepathy also meant that they had a form of communication that could not be observed. I brought them back with me to the bluff, and I could see reactions out of the others as they reached out mentally to reassure them. Azoku and Chalthuxel seemed to bristle for a moment, but calmed back down. Rognar and Greltha remained cool, and the Asu were instantly curious. What none expected was the reaction when they touched Keith's mind. Both of them suddenly reeled back, clutching at their heads. Even their eyes shifted and Keith froze. What happened? His mind, he is painful. His mind is maimed. We were not prepared for the feelings, the memories. How? How does he function like this? I turned to Keith. Step back! They're telepathic! He moved back immediately and sat cross-legged on the ground, where he closed his eyes and began to focus purely on his own breathing. I felt horrible about the instruction, but I figured distance might help. Thankfully, Keith took it in stride and apparently was meditating on a rock. The trills calmed as he quieted his mind, but how would we be able to have them operate around Keith? Keith stayed on his rock while I worked with the trills. I tried to stay as focused as possible because this was important. You said Keith was maimed. He has... He lost a lot, more than anyone should have to bear. 
Our science can aid, but only to an extent, and even if they were a cure out there, there are no doctors here to help him. Is there a way to help him, or even just to be able to not feel the pain? They silently conferred between one another for a moment. We are not familiar with your minds, but we can limit our exposure. We were unready when we contacted his mind, and it overwhelmed us. For our kind, we do not only hear the thoughts, but feel the emotions, experience the memories. His mind, it is a constant maze of pain, grief, loss, and fear. The terror of what would happen to the Rothany if he did not make it to them, it is strange. His memory does not have them as close to him emotionally, and yet terror at the prospect of the deaths of people who are his competitors. He fears for you, that you will come to understand how he feels, but he desires understanding, and we do not know how to process this. We lack a term for it. Cognitive dissonance. His mind is essentially fighting a war with itself, and as to his emotional state, he's been through way too much. Things happen that are so horrible that his own identity is a person. He believes in people, he's kind, and wants people around him, but he's so terrified of losing anyone else that the very thing he craves is the one thing he's afraid of having. I shrugged, figuring I might as well lay out the direct truth. They both nodded in unison. Thank you for your explanation. It is difficult for us, with beings who are not as we. Until we came here, we had never encountered lies or deceptions, nor would any of our people understand them. Other species, however, seem to embrace them. This will make a fascinating field of research for our people. And it is a unique opportunity to be able to observe this grouping. We thank you for including us in your plans. I began leading them the rest of the way into camp. You're welcome, but the plan is Keith's, not mine. Everyone seems to be gathering up around the fire for dinner. Dinner was a slight awkward with the trills, and I spent a lot of it smoothing ruffled feathers, as the others were not used to the trills. Keith spent some more time in his meditation before coming down for dinner. He approached the fire cautiously, monitoring the trills, and bowed his head. I'm sorry to y'all for earlier. I'd have taken precautions if I'd known. They bowed their heads as he had and projected acceptance to the group at large. Everyone save for the trills and Keith at ravenously, the trills not needing food, and Keith just sort of eating normally. I smiled. Well, I'm glad to know everyone's enjoying my cooking. Azoku held up a piece of smoked leg meat. Yes, indeed. Fortunate we are that we live with your species' finest cook. Keith nearly choked for a second, laughing, then motioned at me. I mean, it's great, don't get me wrong, Val, but yeah, even she'd be the first to tell y'all this ain't our best cuisine. Hell, we're mostly guessing at how to cook things here. Once again, the eyes of all species were regarding us, and Azoku sat forward, an intense look on his face, and his tail swept the ground behind him. There is better food than this in your world? Greltha sat forward here. Oh yes. Some of their earth foods were sent after we arrived. Something called pizza and ice cream sandwiches. We thought they were spoiling us. Sadly, it did not last long. I looked at my food. Oh yeah, this isn't even close. And even those weren't the pinnacle of human foods. I mean, I've done what I can, but options are limited. So like, when I did the cougar meat, we added these spring onions to it, and mushrooms to enhance the flavor, alongside smoking the meat. Or the fish. We wrapped in these large leaves with some various local herbs, but our options here are pretty limited. Hey, um, shit. We need names for these two we can actually say. Keith only took a moment. Hearth and Prodigal. They were close to the actual sensation I'd gotten, so it fit. All right, Hearth Prodigal. Could you do me a favor? I'm trying to explain earth foods, but I'm afraid something might get lost in translation. Could you project memories of food from my mind to everyone else's as I talk about it? They nodded, and I felt their touch on my mind as I began. I mean, even just this food, we could make better on Earth. For one, we could marinate, which would make the meat more tender and flavorful. We'd also have access to things such as cheese and bread. Heck, just having salt and pepper would make some pretty serious strides. That's not even considering regional dishes, or what we have at cooking competitions. Eyes bulged and Ragnar was wiping saliva from his mouth. Keith, meanwhile, had gotten some sort of epiphany and was marking something down in charcoal, then passed it to me. Potato flour. 
Oh my God, Keith, that's brilliant. We just need more yams and get them all cooked up and dried. If we could get some salt and sugar, we'd be able to make all sorts of stuff. I felt the presence of the trills pull back, and at first I thought it might be Keith, but apparently, as the possibilities in my mind started blooming, it was getting to be too much for them, the equivalent of someone rapidly screaming in your ear out of nowhere. The others were fixated on this, and even without telepathy, it was evident that they wanted to try however much of the foods they'd seen from my memories as they could. Duketha was the first to breach the conversation between me and Keith. Where do we get salt and sugar? Well, salt we could get from the ocean. We take the seawater and boil it down until we have almost no water left, just enough to keep the salt from burning. Then we just strain it, and we have sea salt. Sugar, sugar might be a problem, though. Generally, sugar cane only grows in tropical climates on Earth. Keith put a hand up and responded as I looked at him. Well, actually, one of the farms round where I grew up grew sugar beets as one of their regular crops. Same basic concept as growing the yams. Then we just process them down for the sugar. The beets grow northern. Everyone began talking back and forth from there, working out how to search for various ingredients. Even Azaku was up for it, offering no complaints. None of the others could read our booklet guide for plants, but that gave Keith something to focus on. The trills excused themselves as evening fell, to enter dormancy as they put it, and our tribe developed a game plan for getting tastier food. In the morning, Keith jolted awake again, wiping tears from his eyes. But unwilling to talk about it, he stalked off down to the river to check his nets and wash up. He would also likely be doing whatever it was he did every morning to get himself in the right headspace. It was hard watching him go through this, especially with no ability to offer real help. I could give him all the hugs and encouragement on earth, and it still would be a minor break at best. I got things ready for breakfast. In order to have a bit more variety, we had taken to doing fish in the mornings, with jackalope meat for lunch, usually a stew, and cougar meat for dinner. The trills were up, and Prodigal came up while I was working. Keith's mind is strange. I shrugged, not quite awake. God, I missed coffee. Oh, he's been having some bad dreams lately, I think. But he doesn't want to discuss them. And given his history, I can understand it. That assessment is incorrect. Your species' dreams and his dreams were far from what I would expect given our experiences with him. Given his experiences, we expected that Keith's mind would be as tormented as waking, or that it would be quiet, but it is not. His sleeping mind is quite active, almost more than when he is awake, and his mind feels joy, contentment, togetherness, and love. It is only as he wakes that the fear and anger comes out in waves. I committed a breach of etiquette in the night, and I must make amends. But his mind was so quiet I could not halt my own curiosity and looked through his sleeping mind. There were no fears, no trauma. His mind was completely in balance. He was simply with a woman and a female human child. Kendra and Heather, I believe, he referred to them as. Oh, Christ, his wife and daughter, they died. How can they be dead? His mind paints them as very much alive, and he was happy. I took a breath as I came to understand the deepest part of Keith's horror. He isn't having nightmares. He screams awake because he's waking up. He goes to sleep at night, and they're alive. Then in the morning, he has to reconfront their deaths. He wakes up every morning to relearning that his wife and daughter are dead. Keith's life was a quite literal living hell, and every night he would get some degree of relief, only to be plunged back into the fire every morning. Then he would spend his entire day trying like hell to keep all of us alive and keep things moving forward and repeat the cycle. Something had to give, and if I didn't find a way to relieve the pressure, the one who gave would be Keith. I finished breakfast for the tribe and held myself together enough to make it back into the shelter, engage the privacy mode, and collapse into my hammock before sobbing uncontrollably. Prodigal had talked about what Keith went through, and that would have been bad enough, but it wasn't just words. As the trills had said, it was the memories and emotions that went with it. In one moment, I'd felt the joy Keith had returning home to his family, holding them both, playing with his daughter, singing to her as he held her in his arms, then this hook in my chest as I felt it all being ripped away, the inhuman scream as he realized it was a dream, and the fight in his mind to stay, to never wake, to pull himself back to them.
and the absolute knowledge it would fail. When I came out of it, I was in the fetal position, hugging my knees as the privacy mode timer ran out. I'd felt one moment, and it was too much. Meanwhile, I could hear the sound of Keith outside, arranging the day with the others. I wanted to get up from that hammock, but there was no energy left in my body. Meanwhile, the man whose pain it truly was, was outside, getting everything moving. I fell asleep for a time after that, only awakening when Duketha came to check on me. Lady Val, are you okay? I startled awake, but calmed looking into Duketha's pink eyes. I'm... I'll be okay. The trills saw into Keith's mind, and they were explaining what he was going through, and it was... It was too much. I just needed some time. Let's get going on lunch, shall we? I worry about Keith. He's always really nice, and he's been teaching me and Shin some stuff. And apparently he needs a guitar so he can let us hear some earth music. Duketha moved alongside me as I went out and began the day's work. Most were out of the camp, including Keith, which I asked Duketha about. Oh, Keith's down at the river. He's doing something called water therapy for his shoulder, and Shin is scouting around him. He thumps in every so often. I was familiar with water-based physical therapy, and Keith being an EMT likely had more knowledge of it than I did. With no proper weights and other equipment, it made sense. Water would make the movements of his injured shoulder a lot easier. It would also give him something to do now. That's a good thing. How do you feel about a nickname? Her ear went to the side. What's a nickname? It's a shorter name for people that know you well. For instance, my name is Valerie, or Val for short, which I prefer. I remarked easily as I started arranging supplies. Hearth was still in camp, Greltha and Ragnar were well asleep, and everyone else was gone, so I turned to Hearth. Hearth, can you reach Prodigal? I'm preparing to head out, and I need him. Also, how far can your telepathy extend between one another? I have relayed your message, and as long Prodigal does not cross the horizon, I can maintain contact with him. Well, there's an ability Keith is going to have a field day with. All right. As to you, how about Ducky? She smiled and her nose twitched. Ducky's good. Where are we going? Myself, Shin, and Prodigal are going out to find others. Keith's plan calls for everyone to be present, and we still have a lot of species to gather. So I need you to grab Shin and then stay with Keith, in case he overexerts himself. There's a saying on our world, doctors make the worst patients. So make sure he doesn't hurt himself. I said, gathering up packs and equipment for the trip. Ducky nodded, her entire body now serious, and shot down the side of the bluff toward the river. Moments later, up came Shin. Hey, we're getting more tribe mates. I know where some are. We finished making ready and left as Prodigal got close to camp. With the trills able to freely communicate over distance, we could relay information quickly when we needed to, even specific information. As well, their telepathy itself meant we could cut down the time we needed to work on translations. Shin did indeed know his way around, although not specific directions. Prodigal rendered that point moot, however, as he was able to reach out and feel for minds around him. So once Shin got us close, it was just a matter of Prodigal taking a moment to pinpoint exact location, although his range for that was nowhere near what his range with Hearth was. It could be familiarity or species thing, but it was still a massive advantage. There were no real hurdles as we walked, and with Shin leading the way, we made good time heading back toward the coast. The wind seemed to be shifting, and by the clouds we were seeing from the bluff, we would need those shelters up somewhere soon. Even if the weather hadn't reached us yet, it wouldn't be long now. It was still spring, and those rains would be coming now. Going over what would be needed got interrupted eventually by Shin, who thumped the ground just before our wristbands beeped. The green light was blinking, and we each pressed our button. The holographic screen came up and Ravaj Teak was there in full form. Welcome back, viewers, for another exciting episode of Pre-Warp Survival. Today, we have the different groups of survivors coming together, and it looks as though only one species may make it through this conflict. And what's this? Our first alliance led by the human survivor Val approaching the area. Are they here to trade? To fight? We will be broadcasting this conflict live. We sped up. They were somewhere around here if we were being included in the announcement. Prodigal moved with urgency. Val, I believe I can sense aggression in this direction. 
It wasn't exact, but it was enough, and Shin started picking up noise from up ahead. We broke into a clearing where three other teams were. First, the Vendrix, and they were definitely more reminiscent of elves from Earth fantasy stories. They were thin, with more defined cheekbones and long pointed ears. Across from them were a pair of impressively sized goal. The male one had olive green skin, a pair of small tusks protruding from his lower lip and bellowed across at the Vidrix, while his female companion looked ready to fight, her skin gray. Finally, and smallest of the groups, the Skrens, some sort of humanoid rat species, and all three were staring at a fresh kill. It was a big beast, something like an elk on earth, but its horns did not stand up, but came down along its head. All three shared a trait in common. They clearly hadn't eaten in a bit, and none were willing to give up a chance at so much food. They all looked as the three of us entered the clearing, getting nervous as we broke through the trees. Prodigal gave a warning. Careful, they are all prepared to kill. Prodigal, transmit my words to their minds. Everyone, stop fighting. We have food and clean water on us. Enough for all of you to be fed. We do not need to be enemies. We have a home, we're building shelters, and access to regular water and food. I could only hope that they would be willing to listen, and we started to pull out food to offer, as well as the boon bags. And that's when it went wrong. As the others hesitated, the Skrens decided it was a good time to go for the kill. The goal immediately rushed in with the Vendrick shortly after them. The fight had begun, and if we wanted them all to listen, we would need to first end the fight, and there was only one language they were all speaking right now. Hey everyone, hope you loved the video. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up and hit subscribe for more awesome sci-fi content. You can also support us by hitting the thanks button or becoming a channel member. Your generosity helps us bring you more stellar stories. Every bit counts. Thanks a bunch.